afternoon. Thank you for tuning in to Pushing Limits. I'm Mark Bermoser. Today we will take a look at the ability of persons with disabilities to be employed by the California government. It seems like every year leaders in Sacramento announce some initiative to hire thousands of people with disabilities. But do these initiatives really do anything after the press conference is over? Jacob Lesnar Buxton talked to two advocates who have experience advocating for greater access to state employment for others with disabilities. He also talked to someone with a disability about her personal experience trying to get a state job. You'll hear Jacob throughout the program talking to our guests. We begin with Aaron Carruthers, Director of the State Council on Developmental Disabilities. The State Council on Developmental Disabilities exists to be a guiding force for positive life-altering changes for people with developmental disabilities. We are created in Congress uh, over 50 years ago. There's a council like ours in every state and territory, and we form a sister network that's looking for barriers that keep people with developmental disabilities from living fully integrated lives in the community. We do this through training people to be their own advocates and also joining side by side in that advocacy to change policies, change laws, do whatever we can to change systems to make them work for people who are being shut out by them. The state council does its work by asking the community, the people we serve, what do you want us working on? Uh, we do that every five years and we come up with a five-year plan. And what I think is really fascinating is that Looking at the trends and answers over the last five years or so, there's a change. There's a significant change. Ten years ago, when we asked the question, what do you want us working on? The number one answer people said was largely make sure I don't lose my benefits. I want to keep my benefits, whether they were through the regional center, Department of Rehabilitation, whatever they're receiving in schools, just help me keep my benefits. And that was 2011. Five years later, 2016, we asked the question again. The number one answer was employment. That's a significant difference and significant attitude change. We just finished uh, another cycle. So in 2021, we asked the question again. The number one answers were employment, housing, and safety. The priority of keeping benefits dropped. And I think that reflects a attitudinal change. Some call it the integration generation. People who went to school, K through 12, in classrooms with people with disabilities have now come into their 20s and they're becoming parents themselves and they're becoming parents of children with disabilities and their views on what's possible for their family member and the views for people of people with developmental disabilities of what's possible for themselves has changed in such a significant way that we've changed our work the state has to change the work and soon the employment sector will catch up with what we need, what we want. The most recent data we have on what is the reality of employment for people with disabilities and developmental disabilities comes from the American Community Survey. So in 2019, it's all pre-pandemic. We don't know the impact of the pandemic on employment, but before the pandemic, we had been experiencing a decade of economic growth from the last recession, a decade of people getting jobs, a decade of economic stability. The employment rate for working age people overall was 78.6%. I know we typically talk an unemployment rate, but for this purposes, we're talking about employment rate. But for people with disabilities, it was 38.9%. It was about half. Those numbers didn't change. Through the pandemic, we just saw a steady, almost flat line for employment of people with disabilities. The numbers for people with developmental disabilities are even worse. So in 2017, the most recent uh, year that the Depart California's Department of Developmental Services has released data, 14.5% of, of regional center consumers were considered employed. Keep in mind out of that 14.5%, that also includes people who were in sheltered workshops making as little as $2 an hour. Aaron goes on to explain the goals the state says regarding the number of employees in their ranks and if they're achieving those measures. So state law states that there's, I describe it as a goal rather than a quota. Um, in my mind, quota means a mandate. You have to fill it. This, I believe, is a goal and state departments are measured against it. 
The state law has a number. The number is 16.6%. Their workforce should include 16.6% of people with disabilities. Disabilities is a pretty broad definition. Let me, let me read you all the categories so you know who we're talking about. Um, it's people who are deaf or have uh, serious hearing difficulty. Uh, and people who are blind or serious difficulty seeing, even when wearing glasses, uh, have difficulty reading or driving without corrective lenses or, or have a limited field of vision, uh, have serious difficulty concentrating, remembering, or making decisions because of a physical, mental, or emotional condition, have serious difficulty walking or climbing stairs, uh, have, ser have difficulty dressing or bathing, have difficulty doing errands alone, uh, such as going to a doctor's office or shopping because of a physical, mental, or emotional condition, or have one or more physical or mental impairments or medical conditions that limit a major life activity, um, even if that's you know, episodic, if it's in remission. Departments send out this survey. Employees answer it anonymously. They self-select answers. And from that survey, the California Department of HR produces a report stating how many employees a department has, how many people self-reported that they're a person with a disability based on those criteria. What percentage then does that come out to? And are they meeting their 16.6%? Curious, Jacob, do you have any, would you have, can you take any guesses out of all the departments in California, who would you, which department would you guess has the highest ranking? BDF. I will tell you, the Department of Developmental Services is ranked near the last. Um, Interesting. But, um, I would guess the Department of Aging. Department. Well, let me tell you about the Department of Developmental Services. Um, as of the most recent report that I'm reading, and this is from this year, the last quarter, the Department of Developmental Services has 2,017 employees. And they have 93 employees with disabilities, giving them a 7.5% rate. So out of the 16.6 expectation, they're at 17.5%. You asked about the Department of Aging. Department of Aging is, is closer to the top. So where DDS is in proportion to the bottom, Department of Aging is in proportion to the top. Aging has 168 employees, uh, 27 employees self-identify as people with disabilities, giving them a percent of 16.1% out of the 16.6 expected percent. Who's the top? Who's the top? Yeah. Department of Rehabilitation. Okay, <laughs> I knew it. <that. laughs> yeah. So if you look at the top 10, Department of Rehabilitation is number one, and I'm proud that State Council on Developmental Disabilities is also in the top 10. Department of Rehabilitation has 1,770 employees, 526 self-identify as people with disabilities, giving them a percentage of 29.7% out of the expected 16.6%. Uh, State Council on Developmental Disabilities employs 20.9%. So we are well above, well, I, I'd yeah. say, you know, we are, there's probably about 20 departments that actually meet the 16.6%. The rest are below it. Last year, our next guest, Catherine Campisi, helped pass a law seeking to make the government more accountable to fulfill its goals for the employment of persons with disabilities. Also joining Ms. Campisi in her interview is Amy Yosef a person with a disability looking for state employment. She and Catherine have a lot to say about the issues with finding state work, starting with the website. My name is Catherine Campisi, and I'm a person with a disability. I've had my disability since I was 10 years old, and I am now retired. I worked for the state of California for a number of years in higher education and rehabilitation, and I'm a member of the disability community uh, still doing a lot of advocacy in retirement. And one of the things that I do is work, I'm on the board of the Association of California State Employees with Disabilities, ACSED, and we try to help people with disabilities 
uh, come to work in state service and then be successful in their careers and promote up the ladder as they choose and have the interest and aptitudes to do so. ACCED is a nonprofit organization and it's been in effect since the uh, mid to late 1970s. Its name originally was Disabled in State Service, but we changed it a few years ago to modernize the terminology. So our purpose is uh, action and advocacy on behalf of people with disabilities in state civil service. We do a variety of things. We do training, uh, both for people that are already working for the state, for managers and supervisors and people with disabilities about reasonable accommodation, about new programs and initiatives. Every other year, we have a full day training symposium, either in person or online. Uh, we also are very involved in any policies or legislation that affects people with disabilities. Right now, CalHR, which is the California Department of Human Resources, uh, requires departments to do a report and to sort of say what they're going to do to improve if they don't meet the parity goal. But the bottom line is that report goes into a file. And as far as we know, nobody ever even looks at the report. And so this, uh, the, the bill that we got passed would require them to um, take some departments that are the worst performing over a sustained period of time and really work with them to develop an action plan and then go back and monitor if they're making any progress. After a while, departments know they can file a report and it goes in the drawer and nobody ever looks at it. But if they start getting calls about what did you do in the next year, you didn't do any better, this and that, then we're hoping that that will bring some attention to make them more accountable. My name is Amy Joseph. I have had a physical disability since about maybe 11 or 12. And I also have a learning disability, but has never really truly been diagnosed. I had different classes. I got accommodations in college. So we'll leave it at that. I'm currently working in the animal care field. Um, I'm also currently looking for a new job that does not wear out my body so much. So I've applied to many different positions. One that I recently applied to, and I mean, probably about a month ago, was for a governmental analyst. Unfortunately, with this website, I don't expect to hear anything anytime soon. I feel like the jobs that are offered on calcareers.gov basically are things that you're hoping to come through at some point. Someone will contact you and say, oh, by the way, that application you put in five months ago, we're actually hiring for that position now. I had a conversation again with, with with Catherine and we were talking about, you know, looking at places that are hiring. And I think for me personally, that's great that I have a community of people that I can reach out to and say, hey, which departments are hiring? But for the average person, they don't know. And you're just kind of looking at this is in my area or this is the price range that I need to live the life that I want. Or this is a desk job or this is a physical job, you know, and you just you kind of apply for what you think you like. A lot of times, now this is my opinion, I feel like they're just gathering a pool of applicants. And I've actually seen that paraphrase, I'm paraphrasing, in my email that says, we open this job up again because we needed a larger pool of applicants for this job. And then I hear nothing about that afterwards. Earlier this year, I did have one amazing interview with the water board in San Francisco. I'm not sure. Probably that's probably not true, but I didn't find it on the state website. I found it through some other weird connection and they found my application actually talked to me on the phone and then actually interviewed me over the zoom. And then it was crickets. And so I did the thing that I had been taught to do, which was to contact them and say, Hey, what's going on? And the guy was like, Oh yeah, yeah. This, the process is on hold. And then he called me back the next day and said the job wasn't available. One piece of good news is that the governor has a, an initiative called California Leads, and they just put a whole bunch of money into an effort that they're going to be undertaking to revise the whole process. The website, they know the website is hard to use, and they're going to uh, do a strategic plan. Hopefully it's really meaningful. Uh, and Ag said, we're trying to put our nose in there and, you know, tell them we want to be involved and all this stuff. And 
Are they gonna have a transparent process and you know, on and on? And they say yes, but we, that's yet to be seen. But they, they know that they need to really revise the whole process because it's so confusing. I try to use the web page and you know, I worked for the state for like 18 years and I look at it and I can, I navigate it with difficulty, I have to say. Ed said, we sent them some comments about what we thought was wrong with it, especially around people with disabilities finding, you know, programming and stuff. They corrected a couple of things, but it needs a whole redo and they know that. Um, and luckily this California leads, you know, while there is money, they're going to undertake some of that. Hopefully they'll get a lot of job seekers and a lot of, you know, focus groups to give them input when they redo it, you know, because that's the only way it's going to be successful. The thing, you know, that I always advise people are kind of what one piece of good news is that um, it's hard to prove employment discrimination is so hard to prove. But I think, um, you know, first, there are many aspects of it. I think, you know, when people are lucky enough that they do get an interview and you've got an apparent disability uh, right there, you're, you know, you're going uphill because they're looking at you and they're thinking all kinds of things about how much is it going to cost to accommodate the person? Can they really do the job? You know, they maybe want to ask a million questions, but they know they can't. And, yeah. uh, you know, we, that's why we try to do this recent training we did was for managers on sort of, uh, you know, that uh, advantages of hiring people with disabilities. But, you know, there's that level of discrimination if you get that far. And then there's also discrimination, I think, in that a lot of people with disabilities haven't had as much work experience as other people. So if they start looking at people, you know, they pick for the interviews, the people with the most work experience, well, they're going to naturally discriminate against people with disabilities because you know, it's a circular problem. We haven't been given a chance to get the work experience, you know. So as I say, going back many decades when I had volunteer experience as an intern, if somebody, you know, looked at somebody else that had five years paid experience, they're going to pull their experience, their application rather than mine, you know. So so it's, um, you know, it, there's that level of discrimination too, um, you know, we tell people don't don't disclose, you know, unless you once you get to the interview, if you have an apparent disability, they're going to see it. But but don't disclose. There is the LEAP, which is called Limited Examination Appointment Program, which offers like an alternate exam. Uh, the way the state service process looks works is you have to take an exam. Oftentimes those are online now, uh, but the LEAP exam is uh more sort of what your experience is in various areas. And it's, it's a little, it's easier to pass. And then if you pass the LEAP exam, um, you automatically put in the, you people get rated into ranks and they only interview the top three ranks. But if you use the LEAP program and you pass a LEAP exam, then you do get put into uh, rank one. So that does increase your chances of getting interviewed. But, you know, once again, say it's a staff services analyst, which is an opening job, there could be a thousand applicants. So, you know, again, you're in a big, big pool. The best way to get any job, but I think especially in state service is to already be known by somebody, you know, and that's where either the mentoring or getting on an advisory board or, you know, trying to do it in some area where you know somebody and somebody knows your skills. A student assistant, you know, what I advise people is if they're in college, try to get a student assistant job. So I wholeheartedly agree with everything that Catherine has said. And I'm going to add my little conspiracy theory that we have let the machines win. So not only do you have to have, you know, keywords and buzzwords in your statement to get picked, not only do you have to have more years of experience than the next person to even get chosen for an interview or phone call or an email or whatever it is. And for anyone that's listening to this, the exam that she's talking about is not a test. It is an assessment right. of the amount of skills you have per year that you have done it. So for example, if you've been a cashier for five years, 
that is a part of the exam. That's what they're asking you. How long have you done cashier work? How long have you handled money? And the person that's handled money longer gets a higher score. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. They, that's one thing they need to rename. It is not an exam. That already, as a person yeah. who, had, who has, knows nothing about this, I'm coming to the thing and says, oh, open exams either scares you away or hopefully makes you curious and you click on it and you read, right? Now back to Erin, who explains California's LEAP certification program that is designed to let people with disabilities bypass state exams to be hired. LEAP is a program that is created by the state of California to provide an alternative path for employees with disabilities. So LEAP, L-E-A-P, is an acronym. It stands for the Limited Examination and Appointment Program. That is state speak, if I've ever heard it. Um, so yeah. uh, let me break it down for you. Getting a job with the, the state of California, it's a civil service program. Individuals take an exam. That exam can be varied based on what the position is. It, the exam could just be based on your past experience. It could be based on your technical knowledge. But you take an exam and the exam puts you on a list. Once you're on the list, you find out whether or not you're what's called reachable. If you are reachable, then you start applying for jobs. Then you go through a typical job application interview process. But it's that first step of taking the exam and becoming reachable that the LEAP program helps with. What it does is it provides an alternate to that process of taking the exam by giving people experience. So people with disabilities, can be qualified through the Department of Rehabilitation as being a person who's eligible for LEAP. And when they apply for job openings, they are considered to be reachable. So they would go through the typical applying and hiring process. Once they are hired, they serve for largely a probation period. Once that probation period is over, they are in the job. It helps because you do get to have an alternate pathway into that full-time permanent civil service working for the state job. Any option, any creativity that we as humans can come up with and the state will adopt, I think the better. So I think that it exists is, is a good thing. They're trying to build on it and make it even more successful. So for example, if you are a regional center consumer, there is a specific internship that will give you work experience to then become LEAP eligible. So it's almost a, a pipeline. If you're a regional center consumer, you can get the specific internship for state civil service. Once you're done with it, you become eligible and then you're on the LEAP list. And then from there, you can apply for jobs. So uh, they're working on building those connections, those linkages, those pathways, which just Taking my local regional center TCOC had training in people in internships to you to go and none of them got a job offer after the year. Uh, Jacob, I, I am sad to say that my direct experience with the program is the same. Did you hear what just happened right then? Jacob said that 29 people were in a year of internship in the LEAP program and not one of them got a job at the end. And Aaron Carruthers, who likes this program very much, said his experience was the same. This doesn't sound good. How could someone with a disability get one of these well-paid jobs? Here's Amy Joseph again talking about other barriers for those of us who want a job with the state of California. There are so many profile platforms like LinkedIn, sorry, LinkedIn, um, where the discrimination starts with just your picture, whether we're talking about race or we're talking about that I can see your, your wheelchair in your photo mm -hmm. or you purposely put your walking cane in your photo and you took a well, like way stand way back kind of picture on purpose. Also, the discrimination starts there because you're you're kind of forced into like on Indeed and LinkedIn, you know, post all of your experience. So anybody at any time that has access on the other side, on the employer side, that wants to look you up and see if you're just tailoring your resume to their job description, they can look you up mm -hmm. and they can discriminate you right then and there. And the job fair 
that was in the Sacramento area for underrepresented groups. And it was, a legislator was sponsoring it and they got so frustrated because a lot of the departments that were participating, it was clear that most of the people they were gonna hire were people already in, in another state department that were doing the job, maybe at the slight level below, but it was like almost a closed system. You know, they're like, well, for us, it's a, it's a automatic, uh, more likely success if we know somebody's already doing the almost the job in state government and we're like but you're never going to bring anybody in from the outside if you do that you know and so yeah. it was very frustrating they presume that the person because the person's already been in state government and maybe doing the job you know at a slightly lower level but a similar job that they have a higher chance that that person's going to be a good performing employee than somebody coming in from the outside. That That's how it plays out. Although we didn't address the topic in the program, it's important to consider that not everyone with a disability can work. California can launch hundreds of employment initiatives and still not reach everyone. Creating a society where all people have access to food and shelter, whether or not they can work, should be a priority for the state. Speaking of priorities, I'm Adrian, and I have one for you this weekend. The 10th Annual Bay Area International Deaf Dance Festival is coming to San Francisco over the next three days. It's produced by Antoine Hunter's Urban Jazz Dance Company, California's only black deaf-led professional dance company. Deaf artists are flying in from Colombia, Canada, India, and all over the U.S., the festival has four major performances and workshops in jazz, hip-hop, ballet, and ASL dance. And they're all taught by local deaf, hard of hearing, and hearing artists who sign fluently. There's a great depth and variety in their accessibility options, too. Sadly, the main performance space at Dance Mission Theater has had a delay in the installation of its elevator. So if you need that kind of access... You can find it only at the Sunday performance at the Mission Cultural Center for Latino Arts. To find out more about the COVID precautions and everything else about this exciting, amazing, wonderful festival, go to realurbanjazzdance.com. realurbanjazzdance.com. By the way, the East Bay's Axis Dance Company one of the nation's most acclaimed ensembles of disabled and non-disabled performers has an evening of world premiere pieces called Adelante, coming up on the weekend of September 17th at the ODC Theater in San Francisco. Today is the last day for Early Bird $20 tickets. Their website is axisdance.org. Axis, A-X-I-S, A-X-I-S. AccessDance.org. Use the code AccessEarlyBird. You can find these links and more at our website, PushingLimitsRadio.org. Back to you, Mark. Thank you for tuning in to Pushing Limits. You know, thank you to our engineer on duty. Thank you to Jacob Lesnar Buxton for researching and recording the show. I am Mark Ramoser for the entire Pushing Limits crew. Hey, What's up, family? This is Cat Brooks. And I'm Jesse Strauss. We are bringing you a brand new show full of fire. Law and Disorder will air weekday mornings at 8 a.m. right after Upfront. We're going to expose systemic corruption, agitate for resistance, and build the world we all want to live in. Join us August 15th at 8 a.m. for our launch. Let's expose, agitate, and build, y'all. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF, 88.1 FM in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide, worldwide, worldwide at kpfa.org.
Boom.